burning Bethel. Oh, man. Good morning, Bethel. I know, I know. It's good to see you this morning. I know now that you're all seated, would you remain standing with me this morning? You know better than that. Amen. Bless God. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have never looked better than you do right now. Can you just tell them that right now? Bless God. They needed to hear that today. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. As uh, as you're remaining standing, I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of Acts. We're going to go to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 all morning. In fact, we're going to look at the entire chapter. We're going to move through it as quickly as we can as we turn our attention to the church and to the communion of the saints. And for those of you that are just gathering here for the first time, we have been in a series this entire fall that we have just simply entitled The Creed. And in this series, we have been studying the oldest and yet the most influential of all Christian creeds from antiquity. And that, of course, is the Apostles' Creed. And every week, we have been making this our own confession. So we're going to say it again together. And if you're a guest, if you are not a follower of Christ, do not feel any obligation to say this with us. No one is going to judge you. No one is going to look down upon you. It's just that we want to make this our confession. Remember, the word Catholic means universal. So let's say it together and say it like you mean it. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen and amen. Would you give the Lord praise one more time in his house if you believe these things. And Father, we thank you for this journey that we've been in and how you have met us every week and re and reestablish these truths that we know but sometimes we've drifted far away from. And I pray this morning that once again as we go into the word of the Lord that you inspire our heart that you're not through with the church. That you still want to use the church in these last days. And may we affirm our belief in the church and what God wants to do in the church in these final hours. May you be glorified in all that is said and done. We ask it in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said amen and amen. One more time, give him a shout of praise in this house this morning for his goodness and mercy that endures forever. Before you see to turn to your neighbor and tell him you love him in Jesus' name. Now, this morning, we're going to see a significant pivot in this creed, because up until this moment, um, our attention has been drawn to God the Father, God the Son, and last week we looked at God the Holy Spirit. But this morning in the creed, the attention is going to be turned to the believers, especially the church and the communion of the saints within the body of Christ, the church. How many of you love the church of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? Can I hear a better amen than that? Just think about it. This morning, there are believers all over this planet that have gathered together to celebrate the name above all other names. And let's just one more time lift our voice and thank our God for all that he is doing and all that he has done and yet to do in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So we have been talking about last week the Holy Spirit 
And it's out of this discussion on the Holy Spirit that we are introduced to the church and the communion of the saints. Last week, if you were here looking at what Jesus taught his disciples in the upper room on the night that he was betrayed, we learned more about the work and the ministry and the activity of the Holy Spirit within the life of the believer. We learned that the Holy Spirit abides within us. We learned that he teaches us. He is, a, he is our instructor. We learned how he testifies of Christ in our lives. We also learned how he convicts us of sin, of righteousness, and of coming judgment if we remain in our sin. But then he also guides us that he is the one that directs our lives. We are called to live in the Spirit by setting our mind on spiritual things. We are then to be led by the Spirit, and we are empowered to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lusts or the desires of our own lives, but live for the glory and the honor of Almighty God. But I want you to know that it is with great significance now that we turn our attention to the church because it is out of the Holy Spirit that the church was born and the church has been formed for the glory and the honor of God. And we are going to turn our attention to the book of Acts because in Acts chapter 2, we see the early formation of the church, which is the gathering of the called out ones. And if there was ever a time when we needed to again affirm our belief in the church and the communion of the saints, it is the day that we are living in right now. Because we are seeing a massive uh, abandonment of the church. We are seeing men and women just abandon the church. They do not believe that the church is relevant any longer, that the church has any impact in the world uh, any longer. And it's not just in the unbelieving world. We're talking about professing Christians. In some cases, Christians that have been saved for decades that are now abandoning the church. More and more, you're hearing men and women say, I'm a Christian, I just don't belong to a local church. I read the Bible at home, I pray at home, I try to do good works, but I don't belong to the local church because I no longer believe that it is necessary. I no longer believe that that is what God actually intended. But I'm going to tell you, there's one person who has not abandoned the church, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. He shed his blood for the church universal and the church locally. And God intended his followers to be a part of a local church. And so we need to say in this hour, I still believe in the church. And I still believe in the communion of the saints. And that God does great things through his church for the glory and the honor of his great name. You know, a lot of people, when they think of the church, sadly, they think of this building. And they will say, we got to go to church today. But can I tell you, this building is not the church. This building is where the church meets. The church, literally, in the Greek, it's ekklesia. It means the gathering of the called out ones. How many of you were called out of darkness to walk in the marvelous light of Christ Jesus? Can I hear a good amen? Well, we are a gathering of the called out ones. We have all been called out of darkness to walk in the light of Christ, and Christ has gathered us together to be his body in the earth and to glorify his name in all that we do in Jesus' name. And so I want you to know that God is still in the church And in Acts chapter 2, what we see is the birth and the early formation of this gathering of the called out ones. But what I want you to see this morning is that even in its infancy, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the church not only influenced the city of Jerusalem, 
but it influenced the nations of the earth that were under the authority of Rome. No matter what Rome did to silence Christianity, it could not. The church just kept growing and growing and growing. And it all started with the local church right there in Jerusalem. And even though it was in its infancy, and even though it was filled with flaws, because they leaned upon the power of the Holy Spirit and the leadership of the Spirit of God within them, they were able not only to transform the city, but to actually transform the nations of the earth at that time. Can I tell you that the local church is still the hope of the world? Can I hear a better amen than that? The local church is the hope of the entire world. Now, some people balk at that because they say, well, wait a minute, Jesus is the hope of the whole world. No kidding. But who is the church? The church is the body of Christ. That is not a metaphor. We are the body of Christ. Jesus established the church so that after he returned to the Father, he could send us the Holy Spirit who empowered him to do the work that he did so that we could continue that work for the glory and the honor of God. In fact, Acts chapter 1 says that Jesus began this work. His work never came to a conclusion because it continues with us. That's why Jesus said, it's better that I go to the Father because if I don't go to the Father, the Helper will not come. But when I go to the Father, I'm going to pray the Father and He's going to send you the Holy Spirit so the works that I am doing, you're going to do also and even in greater measure you're going to do them because the Holy Spirit is going to abide within all believers and is going to transform the world in Jesus' mighty name. Remember, earlier in this series, we talked about what Jesus said about the church. In Acts chapter, uh, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, he says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And remember, rock there is not speaking of Peter, as some have suggested. It is the confession that Peter made earlier. He said, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, it is upon that foundational confession that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build the gathering of the called out ones. Notice, he doesn't build up the individual. He builds up the gathering. So much for those that say, well, I'm going to separate myself from the local church. Jesus said, I build up the individual Christians as they gather together as the called out ones. I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, the gates of death will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys, those represent authority, of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will have already been bound in heaven. That's what it literally means. And whatever you loose on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. So what Jesus said is, I'm leaving. But after I leave, there are going to be men and women who are going to make the confession. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And I'm going to gather all that make that confession together and I'm going to build them up as my body and I am going to build them in such a way that not even the gates of hell will be able to prevail against them and then I'm going to give them the authority to conduct kingdom business on this earth that whatever the father has already declared in heaven they're going to be able to do it here on this earth they're going to carry out the mission of God on this earth I'm going to tell you church God is not through with his body and And if we can be filled with the Spirit of God, anew and afresh, we can turn this world upside down in Jesus' mighty name. Can I hear a better amen? Can I hear a better amen over on this section? Because I don't know if you've woken up yet. Amen. I love you all. God is still changing lives today, and I want to be a part of it in Jesus' name. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to walk through Acts chapter 2. And I want you to see how God used the church 
to change the city, believing that God can use this church and any church that calls upon the name of the Lord to change our cities, our townships, even our state, even our country for the glory and the honor of his great name. First of all, would you notice with me the creation of the church? The creation of the church. Look at verse number one. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, and I've got to stop, I don't want a bunny trail here today, but I need to clarify some things, especially if you're not familiar with the Bible. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, uh, the day of Pentecost was a major feast for Israel, okay? And you have Jews that are dispersed all throughout the Roman Empire, But they were commanded to come back to Jerusalem from wherever they were living and celebrate not only the Passover, but also 50 days later, the day of Pentecost, which was a celebration of the harvest. So you have millions of Jews that are descending from the Roman Empire into Jerusalem. They've already celebrated the Passover when Jesus died, but now they're going to enter into the celebration of Pentecost, of harvest, but this time it's going to be a harvest of souls for the glory and for the honor of God. So when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, now they is the 120 of followers of Christ that have gathered in the upper room because Jesus commanded them, you tarry in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high and the Holy Spirit comes. So they were all in one accord in one place when suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues or other languages, it means that, as the Spirit gave them the utterance. What I want you to see here is that this is where the church was born. The church was born of the Spirit of Almighty God. The church was born in the power of the Spirit of God. And I don't know about you, but I get excited about that because earlier in the creed, what did we talk about? The fact that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, meaning that the whole, that it was the Holy Spirit that brought about the conception of Christ. It was not because of any human invention or any human intervention. It was supernatural by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's only right that the church was not created by man or brought forth by the desire of man. It was birthed by the Holy Spirit of the living God Almighty, which tells me that from the very beginning, the church was meant to be supernatural in its existence and it grieves my heart how you can explain everything that happens in a church today in human terms there was always meant to be a supernatural dynamic when we got together that could only be explained by the hand of the living God Almighty and we got to get back to the days of the supernatural in Jesus name can I hear a good amen on that praise God there came a sound from heaven The church was birthed out of heaven. It was birthed out of the heart and out of the mind of our Father. A church that is born of man, a born of a denomination, born from a boardroom, is destined to fail. The church must be born of the Spirit of the living God. And I am praying in this hour that we will get over ourselves and our need to have credit for everything that happens and we will wait upon God for fresh fire so that that everything that happens here has to be attributed to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst. In Jesus' name. Can I hear a good amen? I want you to notice that there were three visible manifestations of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Three. There was the sound of wind, there were tongues of fire, and then there was miraculous speech. And all of them should be present within the church, maybe in a modified form. Okay, first of all, there was the sound of wind. And obviously, the sound of that wind was telling them that the Holy Spirit had come. 
that the Holy Spirit was now moving upon them and breathing life into them. And my mind immediately went to the Garden of Eden when God formed man out of the dust of the earth. And what does it say? He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and Adam became a living being. And I want to tell you that God has formed us in his heart, but we need the Holy Spirit to breathe into us to be a living body. And my prayer is that he would breathe into Bethel the anointing of the Holy Spirit that destroys yokes in this hour. God, help us to be a spirit-filled church alive in the spirit of God in Jesus name but then there were tongues of fire and evidently there were these little divided tongues of fire that appeared over all of their heads now we don't believe that that happens today be cool if it did we'd at least know who was a Christian in our midst <laughs> We might be saddened to find out who isn't, but it would be neat. But that doesn't happen anymore, okay? But it was a symbol of the work of the Holy Spirit. It was a symbol of the purifying, cleansing work of the Holy Spirit in the church. Can I tell you? That when the Holy Spirit is alive in the church, the church is holy, they are pure, and they are cleansed from the evil that is in this world today. How many of you know that God has still called His church to be holy? Three of you. How many of you know that God has still called us to be holy, to be set apart from this world, to be different? Turn to your neighbor and tell him, God called you to be different, to stand out in this world in Jesus' name. And that is the way the Holy Spirit manifests himself in the church even today, is our separation from this world. But then there was miraculous speech. The Bible says that they began to speak in other languages. The Spirit of God gave them the utterance. Now, you need to know that these were earthly languages that they had never learned. It would be equivalent to me all of a sudden starting to speak in Spanish because I don't know how to speak Spanish to save my life. I'm telling you right now, I want to learn. I wish I could find an easy way to learn that language But if you set me loose in some uh, Spanish area, in some um, area like Mexico or wherever, I would be lost because I don't know that language. These were Galileans. They didn't know the language. And the Holy Spirit gave them that language at that moment. He didn't teach them. He gave them the words, and they uttered it, and they opened up their mouth and declared the glories of Almighty God. Now, I want you to listen to me. Obviously, we preach and teach here that the initial, initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the ability to speak in unknown languages as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. We believe that. But that is another topic for another day. Today, I want you to look broader than that. I want you to see that God was already beginning to tear down all of the divisions and bring together one body from around the world for the glory and the honor of God. It is reminding us that where the Spirit of God is, that the gospel confronts national, tribal, and racial barriers to unite all believers in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Which brings us to the collapse. There was a major collapse that happened that day. And it was a collapse of those barriers. How do we know it? Look at verse number 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, listen, from every nation under heaven. Remember what I said. These are Jews that were dispersed all through the Roman Empire. But had come back to Jerusalem for the Passover and now for Pentecost. And when this sound of them speaking in other languages occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of Almighty God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what could this mean? 
So again, there were multitudes of nations represented there, but they were all hearing their own language from these men who were from Galilee and did not know those languages, but they were declaring faithfully the great wonders of Almighty God and giving praise to Him alone. And immediately, there is a tearing down of walls. Isn't it interesting that even just minutes, minutes into the birth of the church, the walls were being tore down. Generational walls, gender walls, um, national walls, tribal walls, racial walls were all coming down so that what was prophesied long ago would come to pass. And that is that the good news was no longer just for the Jew, but it was for the Gentile, that it was for every nation, for every tribe, and for every tongue. And I want to tell you today, folks, that it is the church that should be the leading voice in racial reconciliation because it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit of God that we can look beyond the color of our skin and literally come together under the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Can I hear a good amen if you believe that? We should be the leading voice. Listen, if you don't like diversity, you are going to be miserable in heaven. Because the Bible says in Revelation 5 and verse number 9 that they sang a new song. And they said, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Can I tell you right now on the authority of God's word, whatever the color of your skin is now, it's going to be the color of your skin for all of eternity. Yet we're going to be one body washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Come on, can somebody say amen? I need to hear a better amen than that. Bless God. The church has got to be diverse. Can I hear a better amen? We're unity but yet we're diverse. We need to be diverse. And I'm thankful for the diversity that is here. I don't know if anybody else noticed it, but I did because I've been here all 26 years. I leaned over to Kathy and I said, boy, we have come a long way because there was one single white man that was drumming today. Everybody else was from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. Come on, somebody. Can you get excited about that? I would never want to go to a church where everyone was the same color because God is a multicultural God. Come on, somebody praise him. When the spirit of God is at work, then there is a breaking down of the walls and we come together as one in Jesus' name. Come on, give God the shout of praise that he deserves in Jesus' mighty name. That unity only comes through the Holy Spirit. It cannot come through strategies and quotas and forced efforts. We got men and women that are trying to pass legislation to force that. You can't do it. It has to be poured out by the Holy Spirit into the heart of man. A love that brings to the realization the dream that Martin Luther King had. That we would no longer judge one another by the color of our skin, but the content of our character because we have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Give him a shout of praise if you believe that today. But then I want you to see the controversy. Boy, I'm going to tell you, if you're going to be a sold-out believer, you've got to learn to deal with controversy. And there was, church was minutes old, and it's already thrust into controversy. Because in 13, it says, others mocking said they're full of new wine, or they're drunk. What that literally means is not that they lost control of themselves. It was obvious that they were being influenced by the Holy Spirit. They were under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and they interpreted it as drunkenness. Listen, folks, we need to be men and women who are directly influenced by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we need to understand that's going to be controversial. Even what I just talked about is controversial. There are professing Christians that would never want to hear what we just talked about. They believe we should be segregated because we all have different identities. Not if you're a child of God. Because we share the values of the kingdom, not of the nations of the earth. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? But there's always going to be controversy. In fact, since when was the church not controversial? 
Since when has a church not been misunderstood and misrepresented and demonized and scandalized and marginalized and stigmatized? I mean, we've always been controversial, and you need to understand that if you're going to be sold out to God in this hour, and you're going to live an uncompromised life in Jesus Christ, you're going to have to warm up to the idea you're going to be controversial. And that the majority of people you meet are going to want nothing to do with you. You just need to accept that. As Jesus became more and more um, deliberate in his preaching and teaching, and he started telling them, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me, that's when the masses started leaving him. The crowds that loved him left and abandoned him when he started really talking about discipleship. Because everybody was there for a free meal. And all of a sudden, they realized that this was a new kingdom, and, and it was controversial. Even the gospel that we preach, if it's left and, and, and presented in its raw, unedited manner, is going to offend the overwhelming majority of men and women. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians. In chapter 1, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block or a rock of offense, and to the Greeks, it's foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul said, you need to understand that if you are going to preach the unadulterated word of God, and you are going to declare Christ and him crucified, that the majority of men and women are either going to find that deeply offensive, or they're going to find it foolishness. And the temptation is going to be to sand out those rough edges to make it more palatable to the crowd. But he said, the moment you do that, you make the cross of no effect. You can't be moved by the masses. You have got to stand fast because even if it's only one, anyone who believes in that gospel, it'll be the power of God to save them from an eternal hell. Folks, no matter what the cost, we have got to be willing to die for the gospel of Jesus Christ. For there is no other name given by which man may be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. Can you give him all the praise if you believe that today? Now I want you to see the clarity. The church is meant to bring clarity in the hour that we live in. Look at this, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and he said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, which was nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Joel was a prophet that lived hundreds of years before this event and prophesied in Joel chapter 3, I believe it is, of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would come. And what I love about this is that there is confusion about all that is happening, questions surrounding, and what does Peter do? Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he opens up. Now, he doesn't physically open up the Bible, but he opens up the Scriptures and identifies what's happening. If there is anything that the church should be known for, it is the ability to clarify what is happening in our world, what is happening in the lives of men and women, and literally put that into a spiritual and biblical perspective by using the word of the living God Almighty. I love this, and, I, and, and I've loved it for a number of years when the Lord really laid it upon my heart. Peter was able to look at what was happening at that moment. He was able to process all the questions that many people had, and he was able from Scripture to identify what was happening and to answer those questions to bring clarity to that moment. And we have got to understand that that is our responsibility, not just mine. When I stand here on Sunday morning or when I'm teaching on a Wednesday night, whenever the Word of God is being declared here, we are simply addressing what we see happening in the world, and we're bringing clarity from the Word of the Lord to say, this 
is that which is happening. And then to lead and direct. But you have to be able to do that on your own. You have the same spirit. We talked about it last week that I have. And God wants to show you in your private time how to address what's happening in your workplace, in your school, in your university, in your family, so that when confusion fills their heart, you can open up the word of God and say, this is that which was spoken in the word of the Lord and bring clarity so that there is salvation in Jesus' mighty name. I want you to listen to this. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Paul identified the church as the house of God, the church of the living God, listen, which is the pillar and ground of truth. We have got to be the pillars of truth because in an age where truth is relative, where everyone can decide for themselves what truth is, we stand and declare, no, there is an objective standard of truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we are not going to, we're not going to contemporize the gospel to accommodate your emotions, your feelings, and your attractions. We're going to preach the truth because the truth will set you free. In Jesus' mighty name. Can I hear a good amen if you believe that today? But with that came the commission. There was the commissioning of the church, what the church was commissioned to do. Look at it with me. Reading from, again, uh, Joel. He's given this prophecy of Joel in Acts chapter 2 and verse 17. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. How many of you are thankful that even in the midst of judgment, God has provided a way of escape in Jesus' name? Understand what you just read is what the church has been commissioned to do in this last day. The church, empowered and enlightened by the Holy Spirit, was called in the last days to be the voice crying out in the wilderness to flee from the wrath to come. Just as John the Baptist was the forerunner to the first coming of Jesus and was called to prepare the hearts of men and women for that coming, so the church in these last days has been sent to be a forerunner to the second coming of Jesus Christ to declare judgment is coming, but there is a name that has been given by which you might be saved. Flee from the wrath to come and come to Jesus in his mighty name. Can I hear a good amen? We have been called to do that for the glory and the honor of God. Our call is to the young, to the old, to men and to women, our sons and our daughters. Let us stand in this hour and prophesy to them. Not saying, you know, thus saith the Lord and then giving this individual prophetic word. The idea there is that again we can open up the word of God and we can teach them and speak prophetically to their life that wrath is coming but there is a way to flee from it and it's through the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior as the church filled its commission there was also a cry look at this in verse number 37 it says now when they heard this they were cut to the heart the heart is the will they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do oh would to God that we would start hearing this generation say to the church, what must we do? What should we do with impending judgment? You know what hit me the other day is that the cry out for what shall we do came as the Holy Spirit worked in the church. I think that's important to note, that it was the Holy Spirit working in the church that actually solicited the cry of the unbeliever, what shall we do? 
It wasn't a national crisis. It wasn't an international crisis. It wasn't even a personal crisis that, that brought forth that cry, what shall we do? It was the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason I say that is simply because I believe many of us think that the majority of people would come to Christ if there was a crisis, if there was a national crisis, an international crisis, or even a personal crisis, that out of that they would cry out, what must we do? But can I tell you, even though there are exceptions to this, the majority of people that come to Christ do not come to Christ because they're all filled up with their emotions. They come to Christ because someone intelligently broke down the gospel of Jesus Christ to their heart and their mind. And I'm not just pulling that out of nowhere. Because I've been here long enough that I've gone through national and international crisis. In fact, I was pastoring when 9-11 happened. And many of you here today went through 9-11 with me. And you know that for three weeks, right after 9-11, the church was packed. People I had never seen before came to church And they were saying, you know, what do we need to do to be saved? And they were so afraid of everything was going on. But as things returned to normal, as the threat began to leave, everybody went right back to their house, went right back to their life because we made an emotional decision rather than an intelligent decision within the heart. I'm going to tell you, folks, it is when God is allowed to move in our midst that the nations begin to look at us and say, now what must we do to be saved? The Holy Spirit, we learned last week, convicts of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. If a church is not filled with the Holy Spirit, then we are never going to lead the multitudes to Jesus Christ. We have got to let the Holy Spirit move in our midst, and then God will begin to change hearts for the glory and the honor of God. I want you to consider what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 24 and 25. He says, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all, listen, and thus the secrets of his heart, his heart is revealed and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. In other words, when you allow the spirit of the Lord to move, lives will be changed. Can I tell you that when the Holy Spirit is free to move among us the way he wants to, when the word of God is preached uncompromisingly and when worship is so pure that God can inhabit those praises men and women will be convicted of their sin their secrets and their heart will be revealed and they will fall upon their face and call upon the name of Jesus Christ what we cannot do in our flesh he can do in the power of the Holy Spirit let's let him move in our lives in Jesus mighty name then out of that came the call look at it This is the call to salvation in verse 38. Peter said to them, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized. Listen to this. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. That is explosive. That's not just additional growth. That is exponential growth. They went from 120 believers in an upper room to over 3,120, and it was in the matter of hours. And I just, as a pastor, I think to myself, you know, what would happen? You know, we've got roughly about 500 that have made it back since COVID. There's still many of you that are watching online. Can I just tell you, it's time to get back to church, okay? Just, you need to get back, okay? I'm just telling you, you need to be back, okay? But we got about 500 of our congregation back now, and I'm thankful for that. But I think to myself, what would I do if all of a sudden, one afternoon, we were all out and we started witnessing, and 3,000 were added to us in just a matter of minutes? Like, I, I just would think, oh, we're not ready for it. They weren't ready for it either. 
But see, that's why you need the Holy Spirit. Because immediately the Holy Spirit directed them on how to organize that and to make it the force that God had called it to be in the earth in Jesus' name. You know, but what I love is that when they asked, what must we do, Peter pulled no punches. He didn't say, well, you need to live a good life. He doesn't say, well, God will help you find your purpose in life. He doesn't say, God has a great plan for your life and, and you just need to follow. No, he says, you need to repent of your sin. He says, you need to turn your back. That's what repent means. Turn your back, do a 180 on your old life, and now you need to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You need to be baptized in the name of Jesus and what he was saying more than anything else, because there have been people that said, see, the only way you can truly be baptized is if you're baptized in Jesus' name. But yet Jesus himself said, no, you're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not the, the mode in which. The idea is when you're baptized in the name of Jesus, baptized means to immerse. And what he's saying is you are being put under. You are being immersed in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He says, you can't keep living your life the way you want to live. You've got to turn your back and submit your life, the rest of your life, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And he says, when you do that, you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will escape the perversion and perversity that is in the world in Jesus' name. I'm going to tell you, folks, this is not a time for the church to be making people comfortable. Jesus did not die on the cross so you can have your best life now. Jesus did not die on the cross to make you healthy, wealthy, wise, and uh, prosperous. I'm not saying that God can't do any of that, but that's not why Jesus gave his life. Jesus laid down his life to be a covering for our sin so that God could be faithful and just in forgiveness forgiving us of our sin, cleansing us from all unrighteousness, filling us with the Holy Spirit so that we're free from this world and live for the glory and the honor of Almighty God. That's what we call men and women to today. And then out of this came the community. The community, and I love this. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, and they, these new believers, all 3,120 of them, they continued steadfastly in what? The apostles' doctrine or instruction and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and every soul is not just in the church. Fear started gripping the entire city of Jerusalem because they knew they were contending with the power of God in the church. Fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. You know what I love about this is now you're seeing the church organizing. They've, they've all been called out of the perversity of the, the generation, and now they're gathering. And, and no one had to stand up and tell them to do it. That's what I want you to see. No one stood up and said, okay, now we need to organize. No, it was led by the Spirit of the Lord. Being Spirit-led, naturally and instinctively, they started to gather together. They knew from the Holy Spirit they were never meant to be saved just as individuals. Yes, we all have to individually be saved, but then we're to gather together. That's where the building up takes place. And instinctively, they did it. They started to get together. And they continued to submit themselves to the instruction of the apostles, and they fellowshiped with one another. They communed with the saints formally and informally. They went to the synagogue, and they met corporately for worship, but then they met from house to house. And they broke bread, and they shared life together. They worshiped the Lord in the fear of the Lord, and signs and wonders flowed. How many of you believe that our God still works supernaturally? Amen. we got to see that in this hour, folks. And then the Bible says that the most unbelievable thing. They all started selling what they had. And they gave the proceeds 
to the church, and they distributed as anyone had need. Now, (laughs) the Bible is not Marxist. Some people have tried to twist this scripture and say that this is why Marxism should... No, 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 no. No one forced them to do anything. The government did not mandate this. This was all free will. And they didn't sell everything that they had. That's not the intent that's behind this. And live in a communal. That that wasn't the idea. Everyone began to realize, wait a minute, everything I have belongs to God. How many of you know that everything you have, including the breath you're breathing right now, belongs to God Almighty? Everything. Okay. Three of you. How many of you know everything? Everything belongs to God. God gave it to you, and He can take it away. Everything you have belongs to God. And they knew that. They recognized it now. And they said, you know what? We have everything that we need, and yet we keep piling it up. And Jesus said, woe to that man that keeps piling it up. He says, you know, we have what we need. Let's start selling off. Let's start getting rid of all the excess. Let's just start getting rid of it, and we'll give it to the church because there's people in the church that don't have what they need. And it's not, because they're not, it's not because they're lazy. It's just because of difficult times that they're in. Because the Bible still says that if you don't work, you don't eat. Could somebody write a letter to President Biden and just remember that? Okay. <laughs> not knocking him, just saying, if you don't work, you don't eat. That's a biblical principle. Now, obviously, we know, man, when you go down these bunny, bunny trails, you just realize there's always somebody. Well, some people can't work. Okay, we get that, all right? We're not talking about it. But what was happening is the church began to realize, here I am, and I got all that I need and more, and I just keep expanding my kingdom, and that's not how God wants me. If God is giving me more, it is so that I can be a blessing to someone else. The the cool thing is that God keeps blessing those who give in Jesus' name. But they just started doing it, and all of a sudden, need was eradicated from the body of Christ. It was just eradicated. Everyone was blessed in a great way. Folks, I'm going to tell you, that's how God intended the church to be. A church that communed together for the glory and the honor of his great name. I still believe in the church. Can I hear a good amen if you, if you believe in the church? Oh, you know, there are people, and I do, and let me just go, well, we're going to address this right now. Because there are people that say, well, I'm a Christian, but I just don't go to church. And let's get rid of that, you know, because church has never saved anybody anyway. But they'll say, I'm a Christian, I just don't belong to a church. I don't think I need to belong to a local church. I can worship God in my own home, and I can read my Bible, and I can pray. Okay, I'm not going to argue with you today on whether or not you're a Christian. Okay, I, I, Going to church doesn't save you. Not going to church doesn't damn you to hell. I'm not, not going to say that. Those people, if, if you're watching, if you're listening here today, however it is, you say, I, I am a Christian, but I don't belong to a local church. All I can tell you is the Bible knows nothing about that. You cannot read the scriptures and and think for even one second that Christ intended to save individuals so that they could just be an island to themselves. When you read the Bible, they got involved in a local gathering of called out ones and the Lord built them together in Jesus' mighty name. Now, I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you that you're going to hell, all right? I'm not, if you don't go to church, I'm not telling you you're going to hell. I will tell you that you're living unbiblically. You're living an unbiblical life. Now, if you're comfortable going into eternity, knowing that you are defying the word of God, go for it, I guess. But I would never go into eternity knowing that I was openly defying what Scripture clearly teaches. And that is, though I have to be saved individually, once I'm called out of darkness, I'm to gather together with other believers. 
and that Christ has promised that in that gathering, he will build a church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it in Jesus' name. Can you say amen to that? That's the word of the Lord. And then finally, I'm going to do this, the continuation. We're almost done. The continuation, verse 46. So, say this word with me, continuing. Say it with me. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. I love that. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. They just continued in that. Just simple living. They just simply broke bread from house to house. They met corporately from time to time. They ate their food with gladness. They thanked God for what they had. They didn't complain about what they didn't have. They just lived simple lives. They praised God. And as a result of their consistency, they found favor with even the people of the world. And as a result of that, the Bible says that God added to the church daily those who are being saved. How many of you know we should be adding to our church, churches all around should be adding to their numbers daily because we're consistent in doing what God called us to do in Jesus' name. That's what he's called, not to perfection, but to be continual in these things for the glory of the Lord. I believe in the church. How many of you believe in the holy church? Amen. That God is not through with the church at all. He's not. He still wants to use the church. I got to tell you, growing up, I loved church. And back when I was little, when I was young, okay, church wasn't a part of our life. It was our life. Every time the doors were open, we were in church. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Twice a year, we did convention. Some people call them, you know, revivals, whatever you call it. And church was every night for two weeks. And Sunday was Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, Sunday night. Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, Sunday night. I mean, it went on. And you're like, well, didn't you have to go to school? Yes. I did. Well, well what, if, what if you had basketball practice? I wasn't in it. What if you had a game? I didn't play. Church was life. Now today, we'll take our kids out of church for months to play baseball or soccer. And then when their kids get to be 18 and want nothing to do with Jesus, they come to us and say, what did you do wrong? No, it's what you did wrong. You told them that kicking a ball was more important than being with Jesus on Sunday. <laughs> I'm just telling you, you know, it's, it's just, we got to get back to where, where we need to be, where Christ was not a part of our life. He was our life. Amen. And the, the, the church, I mean, that was my social life. Every, my best friends were in my church. Kathy and I, we met in the church. We met in high school, but it was in church that we developed our relationship. I mean, it was my life. Now, I gotta be honest. <laughs> 32 years of pastoral ministry, I've gotten a little jaded. I really have. I, I wish I could tell you. But you know, you can only take so much. You know, people coming in with their garbage. I've seen the good, I've seen the bad, and I have certainly seen the ugly. And sometimes, you know, it gets tiring. But can I just tell you, I hope this doesn't sound bad, but just in recent months, the Lord has reminded me of the church and how it formed the man that is before you today. 
I'm thankful for the church. And we'll live with the good. And we'll live with the bad. And we'll live with the ugly. And we'll keep preaching the unadulterated word of God. Because God hasn't given up on the church. In Jesus' name. Can, can I hear a good amen if you believe that? Can I, can I just read you this text? Okay, and we're, we're going to be done. I, and I'm reading it out of the Amplified Version. But I want you to consider, this is what God wants to do in the church. And so this is Ephesians 1. And so that you may know and understand what is the immeasurable, unlimited, and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named, above every title that can be confirmed, not only in this age and in this world, but also in the age and the world which are to come. And and God the Father has put all things under Jesus' feet and has appointed him the universal and supreme head of the what? The church, a headship exercised throughout the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. For in that body, the church, lives the full measure of Jesus, who makes everything complete and who fills everything everywhere with himself. Mind blown. When I read that text, it just takes my breath away. Because you know what he's saying? Remember what Paul taught us in Colossians. In Jesus dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In other words, when Father, Son, and Holy Spirit wanted to reveal themselves to mankind, they did it in Christ. The fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Christ bodily so that wherever Jesus went, he was putting on display God Almighty. In the same way now, Paul says, that in the church, which is the body of Christ, the fullness of Jesus dwells bodily. So that wherever the church goes, we are putting Jesus on display. That is how God wants to use the church in this hour. It is not about us. It has never been about our vision. It has never been about our dream. It is about magnifying Jesus Christ in a lost and a dying world. He fills all of the earth with Christ through the body. He wants to fill every street, every avenue, every house, every city, every Every state, and he does it through the body of Christ. I still believe in the church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody give God all the praise if you believe that. Stand to your feet. Come on, give him a shout of praise in this house. Hallelujah. We magnify you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless your name, bless your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Holy Spirit, thank you for birthing the church and empowering the church and filling the church with the fullness of Jesus that wherever we go, we can fill the earth with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, how I wish I had another hour and I would just be able to talk about how We were put in this earth to be a preservative. Lord, until Christ comes again, we were to be the salt of the earth. And that wherever we go, we were to slow down the decay. And Lord, as I look at our country falling apart morally, I am thinking to myself, it is time for spirit-filled believers to start running for offices, to start running for school boards to, Lord, look for ways to influence so that we can fill our schools and our universities and our courthouses and our places of influence with the knowledge of Jesus Christ, even as the waters cover the sea. Lord, help us to get out of this escapism, this mentality, I'm just waiting for Jesus to come so I can get out of here. No, we were called to be here until Christ comes again and to occupy the land. Until Christ comes, may we do it, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. 
We ask it in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said amen and amen. Come on, give him another shout of praise. If you believe it this morning, amen. Now go out and magnify Jesus today. Come on. Love you. God bless you. Have a great week.